Welcome once again to another investment analysis video. I'd like to continue with our discussion of utility of wealth and risk aversion. Risk averse investors um, are investors who hate losing X dollars more than they like winning X dollars for all values of X. And it's important that we recognize with this that the idea is hating losing X dollars relative to liking winning X dollars. It's not just the dollar amount, rather it's the uh, psychological response to the loss or the win. So again, risk averse people um, don't want a fair bet, right? A fair, what's a fair bet? Well, a fair bet is when uh, the probability of the win <clears throat> equals the probability of the loss, <clears throat> and when the uh, uh, dollar size of the win equals the dollar size of the loss. Okay, that's a, a fair bet. And risk-averse people aren't interested in that um, because... Um, if you think about it, let's say this is going to be 0.5, of course. And let's say the, 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 it's a $100 win and a $100 loss. Um, uh, the expected value of the bet is the probability of a win times the size of a win plus the probability of a loss times the size of the loss. And so we get 50 plus a minus 50, which, of course, is zero. Okay, so the expected value is zero, but if you hate losing X dollars more than you like winning X dollars, then this is of no interest to you. Okay, this is of no interest to a risk-averse investor. Okay, so somehow you need the expected value to be positive. <clears throat> um, and uh, how positive it has to be depends upon the uh, utility wealth function. Uh, that is the nature of risk aversion of the investor. And we're going to explore some of these issues now. And uh, okay, so um, again, risk averse investors are not interested in a fair bet. They hate losing X dollars more than they like winning X dollars. Oh, by the way, a, a risk seeking investor. Uh, likes winning X dollars more than they hate losing X dollars. So just the opposite for risk seeking. And of course, risk neutral investors don't care about risk at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> it might be interesting to look at the uh, uh, indifference curves of uh, these various uh, types of investors. So here we're going to have indifference curves. The space we're going to have is uh, mean historical returns on the vertical axis and standard deviation of returns on the horizontal axis. And uh, this is risk, and risk is bad. Right? And this is return, which is good. So this is different than the indifference curves that you ran into in your econ courses where... Uh, you had a good Y and good X, and you were happier as you went uh, northeasterly. In this case, since the value on the horizontal axis is a bad, we get happier uh, as we go uh, northwest. And in fact, the indifference curves um, look like this. So if we draw a lot of indifference curves, it's called an indifference map. And just make sure you realize that in this case, uh, greater utility is associated with moving uh, north, <coughs> excuse me, northwesterly <coughs> on the indifference map. Okay. <coughs> now these indifference curves I'm drawing here are for risk-averse investors. Okay. They are positively sloped and. Uh, Higher levels of utility are associated, associated again with uh, northwestern movement. Okay, um, but it's interesting to give some uh, uh, time to seeing what uh, 
indifference curves look like for other types of investors. Let's take a quick peek at uh, indifference curves for a uh, for risk-seeking investors. Okay, this one's kind of interesting. Uh, I'll just draw one for now, and they look like that. Negatively sloped, uh, concave, and... Uh, What's, what's this mean? Well, think about it. If this is an expected return, or over here we have expected return, which is the same as mean historical return. Down here we have standard deviation of return. And if, if it has this shape, what this says is that um, they are uh, perfectly happy with 10% for sure, but if they can just get some risk, say that amount of risk, whatever that is there, they're willing to take a lower expected return. Okay? just because they got some risk. Now, if you think about it, what this means is the actual outcome is, is going to be uh, something that uh, is going to lie maybe within you know, this range here. And, of course, what they're doing is they're dreaming about these returns up here. And uh, that's just the way risk-seeking investors are. And then so the indifference map, I'll just draw some more, would look like this. So that's the indifference map for risk-seeking investors. Quite, quite interesting, very unusual. Um, how about uh, the uh, indifference map for uh, risk-neutral investors? Okay, so there's mean historical returns, mean standard deviation of returns. Well, think about it. If you don't care about risk, if risk doesn't matter, you make your decisions based solely on expected returns, that means the indifference curves are horizontal lines. So this is the indifference map for a risk-neutral investor. Um, if you don't care about risk, you don't care about risk. And that's what this says. And uh, <clears throat> Very few people uh, are risk-neutral. Maybe no one, but it's an, an interesting theoretical construct. So that's, that's interesting. So the one we need to know uh, for our analysis is this one. Uh, the indifference curves and the indifference map for risk averse investors and um, and we'll have a lot more to say that about that as we go through the course so now let's um, think about what uh, our uh, utility of wealth function would look like uh, so here we have uh, utility of wealth on the vertical axis I'll just call it U now and W wealth on the horizontal axis, and we've mentioned uh, in the last video that the indifference curve looks like that. Okay, uh, this might be a, a logarithmic function, and uh, <clears throat> we're going to go through. We're going to go through a, a neat little example now. Uh, kind of a little unusual, but it, it ends up being pretty powerful. Let's say you start off with a uh, hundred million dollars, and uh, the amount of utility associated with that, we'll say, is 20 utils, this uh, imaginary unit of measure of happiness or satisfaction or utility, utils. Of course, it's a theoretical construct. Okay, so you're here at 20. And then let's assume that some risk becomes uh, existent in the economy. Uh, maybe it's we're talking about a stock portfolio, and uh, after trading closes for the day, uh, rumors begin to begin to swirl about uh, some supply shock in the system that <clears throat> is believed to potentially cause <clears throat> values of equities to fall. But our uh, little story is going to also assume that it might cause the value of our um, and all equities to rise. So the idea is we're going to assume we have this risky distribution of possible outcomes. RDOPO, risky distribution of possible outcomes. And ours by assumption is going to look like this. Okay, 0.5 probability of us ending up with 50 million after this uh, risk renders its impact and a 0.5 probability of us ending up with 150 million. So <clears throat> notice here, probability of the win equals the probability of loss at 0.5, and 
and that the uh, win size equals the loss size uh, at 50. So let's just you know, 50 equals 50. <clears throat> okay. Now we'll do some analysis. This is actually very important. Um, so here's going to be the 50 outcome, and here's going to be the 150 outcome. So, and we're just pretending it's one of those two. We don't know which. We have to wait till tomorrow morning to find out. And so that means we're going to either be here or here. And now the, the shape of this curve gives us an interesting result. So if I go across here, I end up there. If I go across here, I end up there. Okay? And uh, make these dots a little bigger. And uh, as I've drawn this, you'll notice that this distance is shorter or smaller than this distance. Okay? So that means, uh, and I'll put, I, I, I haven't specified the utility of wealth function precisely. So that enables me just to put values here. So let's pretend that this value here is 22 utils. And let's pretend that this value here is 15 utils. Okay? And the idea is, hmm, <clears throat> because this curve has this concavity, <clears throat> I'm either going to be $50 million wealthier or $50 million less wealthy. And that is symmetric down here on this axis, but not over here on the vertical or the utility axis. And that's the point we're making here, is that uh, because this risk has rendered its, uh, its, its, its face, we immediately, upon the recognition of the risk, suffer a, uh, a decrease in expected utility. Now, let's, let's first of all calculate the expected value of our wealth. Uh, it, it's not a very important figure, but it's just interesting. So we've got a, a 0.5 probability of ending up with 50 million, and we've got a 0.5 probability of ending up with 150. So this is going to be 25 plus 75. So not surprisingly, the expected value of wealth is 100. But, of course, we are not going to get 100, but it is the expected value of wealth. Well, let's get to a much more important concept called the expected value of utility of wealth, EU. And that's just going to be the 0.5 times the utility if we win, and that utility is 22, plus 0.5 times our utility if we end up losing, which is 15. Now, this gets interesting. Uh, this becomes 11, and this becomes uh, 7.5. When you add them, you get 18.5, and now we see that the expected value of the utility of wealth, given this risky distribution of possible outcomes, is 18.5. Note, okay, I'll put it in uh, red, less than the 20 we started with. Okay, so immediately we suffer a decrease in utility. Immediately upon the <clears throat> um, uh, arrival of this risk. And uh, so, hmm, well, let's, let's go up here and think a little bit about what's going on. Uh, I'm going to erase a couple little things to clear this up just a little bit. Okay. There we go. And now let's look at, um, well, here's 18.5. So I'll say 18.5, and that's where we end up. Well, if I was to go to my utility of wealth function, I might be interested in finding out what value of wealth is associated with this value of expected utility, okay? And uh, I'm just going to pretend that that ends up being $80 million, $80 million okay? And this... 80 million here is the amount of wealth <clears throat> that if we had it for certain would give us the same amount of utility we had given this risky distribution of possible outcomes. Okay? 
And so this 80 here is called the Certainty Equivalent Wealth, C-E-W, Certainty Equivalent Wealth, 80 in this example, 80 million. And uh, that's interesting. So the amount of utility we have given this RDOPO is identical to the amount of utility we have we would have if we had a, if we had 80 million for sure. Think about that. That's actually quite interesting. And then I guess it begs the next question: <clears throat> If it was possible to <clears throat> avoid this risk altogether, both the downside and the upside, kind of a you know a, a total avoidance of risk. Remember, risk has uh, uh, two sides. There's there's downside risk and upside risk. And if we were to be able to avoid all this risk, both types of risk, upside and downside. Uh, what's the most we'd be willing to pay to avoid that risk? And then you, you think about it, well, if the certainty equivalent wealth is 80, <clears throat> and we currently have 100 million, that uh, we would not be willing to pay any more than 20 million to eliminate that risk. By the way, this doesn't mean we'd pay 20, we'd certainly shop around, but we'd be willing to pay uh, up to 20 to avoid the risk. Why? Because if we could get rid of the risk and lose maybe, say, $15 million, um, that means we'd be uh, here at $85 million, and we'd be here at some higher level of utility than 18.5, but of course still less than 20. Okay, so again, the important thing to see here is that we'd be willing to pay no more than 20 million to <clears throat> avoid the upside and downside risk in this risky distribution of possible outcomes. And uh, the uh, existence of an insurance policy might be something that we'd be interested in. It's, it's a funny kind of insurance. If you, normally insurance just protects you against downside risk, but this funny insurance policy, funny insurance in quotes, uh, removes all risk, again, both the downside and the upside risk, okay? So these are they're interesting observations. Um, I just summarize it down here in a, in a new graph. Uh, so we, we had a, a two space where we had uh, mean historical returns and standard deviation of returns. Um, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, we'll just jump ahead to the uh, utility as a function of wealth, okay? And uh, we had a risk-averse investor with a logarithmic utility of wealth function. We started off with 100, and then suddenly a risk became... Uh, uh, existent, and we were going to end up with either 50 or 150. As a consequence of this, we saw that our utility, instead of being here, would either be here or here. So this is our utility if we win. This is our utility if we lose. This is our utility uh, at date zero originally. Okay, and then we ended up uh, with some expected utility. I'll put this in red now. We ended up with some expected utility amount there. And then we calculated the certainty equivalent wealth, okay, from that. And then after that, we determined the maximum amount that this investor would be willing to pay uh, for some sort of insurance policy, call it I for insurance. And along the way, we calculated the expected value of wealth, the expected value of utility. These are both, both of these are given the risky distribution of possible outcomes, okay? And then we also calculated um, the certainty equivalent wealth. And, uh, we also uh, calculated the maximum insurance premium that the investor would be willing to pay to avoid that risk if the investor could. 
And we're now, we're shortly going to take this analysis a little bit further, but please spend some time reviewing this and understanding these concepts that I've presented. It's uh, very important. Thanks for watching.